Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we speak about topics such as leadership, presentation skills, visibility, and communication challenges. I interview experts from around the world, and today I'm really excited to have my friend Denise Brousseau of the Thought Leadership Lab to talk to us about how you can become more visible and more valued through thought leadership. But before we get started, I'd like to invite you to take our free assessment at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And there, in only four minutes, you can see where your presentation skills are strong and where you might get a little bit of support in order to get better results and the recognition you deserve. Now I get to tell you about Denise Brosseau. I have known her and been following her ever since I started in the speaking business. She's one of the founders of the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, which has now become Watermark, which is a group that I am very fond of. And she is an expert in thought leadership. She is the person I go to when I have a question and very much worth following. The official bio is speaker, author, and CEO of Thought Leadership Lab. Denise Brousseau works with leaders and their teams to accelerate their journey from leader to thought leader. She believes that thought leadership is not marketing nor sales, but instead is building a following for your ideas, thus building trust and credibility, amplifying influence, and catalyzing the strategic connections that lead to a seat at the table for the conversations that matter. She loves to work with social entrepreneurs, startup CEOs, heads of trade associations and foundations, as well as executives from Fortune 1000 companies. What her clients have in common is that they are all change agents in their field and are interested in building a platform so they can affect social, industry, community, or organizational change. Denise is the author of several books, including the seminal Ready to Be a Thought Leader, Denise shares her ideas about why thought leadership matters and what it really takes to be a thought leader. She's a lecturer at the Stanford Business School on topics of credibility, influence, and thought leadership. Her ideas have been featured in Fast Company, Entrepreneur, Forbes, Salesforce.com, Inc.com, the UK Daily Telegraph Business Reporter, and many, many others. Committed to developing women leaders, Denise has created and led women's leadership programs for Liberty Global, Nimble Storage, Grace Note, KPMG, and many others. She also enjoys facilitating strategy sessions, retreats, and thought leadership development sessions for many, many clients, including the Packard Foundation, Planned Parenthood, PG&E, and other small companies like that. She's been honored by the Silicon Valley Business Journal among their top 100 women of influence. She's been named a champion of change by the White House. And now we have her on Speakers Who Get Results. Let's go to the interview. Denise Brousseau, welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you, Elizabeth. Oh, good. I've been kind of saving you up as one of my absolutely favorite people that I really wanted to have on the program. So I wanted to grow a little bigger. And and now a year and a half in, I said, oh, 
I've got to get Denise on here to talk about thought leadership. Always a great topic for the community that you've brought together. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get into this, uh, into uh, all the many things I want to pick your brain on, let me ask about your dream interview. If you had a chance to interview somebody on stage, who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? And by the way, you gave me a whole list of people. You could have a panel too. For you, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think I would, there's so many incredible, amazing women that have, that really we stand on the shoulders of, uh, but let me just pick one, you know, I'm sure I'm not unique in that, to me, one of my heroines has always been Eleanor Roosevelt, and part of that is she lived very near where I grew up, and I uh, many times in my childhood visited her her home. Um, one of my mother's friends uh, worked at that beautiful place and at the library there, and uh, I've just read so many biographies of her. I, I've admired her, and what I'd love to ask her about is you know, what it was, what it was truly like behind the scenes, you know, what, because she was so often behind the scenes, mm -hmm. just working on such important issues for women's rights and social justice and uh, civil, civil rights, that it really became an interest for me in how she brought these coalitions together, you know, how she kept her grace under pressure and her, you know, honestly, her femininity in the midst of the attacks that she was uh, regularly uh, give, uh, um, undertook yeah. there and how much it was difficult to have a husband who was, you know, in a wheelchair and, and yet is revered as this amazing president. And, you know, he's having affairs and she's dealing with all of that. There was just so much that she uh, went through and yet so much she accomplished at the same time. Yeah. Well, the whole thing about having a pulpit, uh, a place where you can speak, and a position for where you speak leads me to my next question, um, which is, I was we were talking before we started the recording about how you were one of the founders of the Forum for Women Inter Entrepreneurs, which has now become Watermark, which among other things, hosts a huge conference in California every year. Um, I was there once where there were 7,000 people. And I was helping out at the Watermark booth. And they had, I'll tell you, sitting, sitting at the back table for the volunteers when there are 7,000 people there um, really shows you, the, uh, shows you the scope of that sort of thing. It, talk a little bit about how Forum for Women Entrepreneurs began and why. You know, this began so many years ago uh, because women faced an issue that unfortunately we still face today, which is such a dearth of access to venture capital funding. So at the time, uh, it was 1993, I, you know, I want to say I was only 12, but I was a little older than that. And we, you know, the statistic was trumpeted in the news. And one of my business school classmates at the time was doing a research report on why were women not getting any money? And mm -hmm. she, you know, spent a quarter or two quarters looking at sort of the data and the research behind what was what was really the facts of on the ground. And at the end of that, she approached me and a few others to say, we need to do something about this. And of course, she could have gone and tried to start a venture fund for women entrepreneurs. There was a lot of other options, but we realized that the three things that were holding women back were understanding the venture capital process, like how does this work, having a community of connected other women who mm -hmm. were seeking venture capital who could be those 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 um, role models, and then finally resource providers. You know, how can we get to the lawyers and the bankers and the accounts, all the people that it really takes to raise venture capital funding and do it well and build that kind of business. So we started the organization uh, back then in order to address that that number. And my goal at the time was I just I just wanted fifty one percent. I didn't I didn't have much of a requirement, but honestly, in all the ensuing years, I don't think we've ever gotten past seven percent. And we're back down to like seven percent of of the venture funding in the United States going to women entrepreneurs. Yeah. I think now so, we're at 2.7% again. I mean, it's still completely pathetic. 
-hmm. Now it's 2.7% of a larger number. So we do have, we should take credit for that. And there are more Uh sources of capital than there used to be. You know, back then we didn't have crowdfunding. You know, there weren't family offices and other things that don't get counted into those numbers. So women are accessing more money overall, um, significantly more money overall, and yet still a small percentage of the large pie. And so I can continue to be committed to that cause in many different ways. So how does that combine with your work with thought leadership now? Well, really what was so wonderful about having a role, I became the founding CEO of the organization after a few years. So we kind of grew it to a couple of hundred members and finally realized you can't run a nonprofit organization on the side while you have a full-time job in technology. So I I quit my day job. I ran the organization for five years um, full-time. And in that time, I had this wonderful journey to really becoming what I call an accidental thought leader. So, you know, I had this bully pulpit. I had this opportunity to travel around the United States and speak to the press and, you know, get on television and radio and all of these opportunities to really be speaking about this cause of women and access to capital and built an enormous network of people also working on that same issue. But when I looked back after I left and, you know, we found another CEO and the organization continues many years later now. But when I look back at that journey, I really think of it as, someone who had no strategy, had no plan, had no idea what she was doing, really as a thought leader. um, I didn't even know what that term meant at the time, right? Mm -hmm. But fast forward a few years later, I got a call from a friend who said to me, you know, Denise, how you became that thought leader in women's entrepreneurship? She said, I want to do that. And that was the first time it had ever occurred to me that that was the journey that I'd been on. And Mm -hmm. what was wonderful then was to have an opportunity to really be her coach and guide and advisor and consultant over the next couple of years to take her from being completely invisible to being a recognized expert, to being testifying in front of the U.S. Senate, recognized by the White House, headhunted by the governor in three years to go from invisible to that level, I realized that there is a strategy, there is a plan that can take thought leadership to an effective goal and a, uh, a journey that actually is building on itself in a way that isn't an accident like it had been for me. And and after that, I really, that sort of dedicated my career to that. So that is the work I do. I work with other leaders, primarily women on that journey for how can they get their voice heard? How can they move forward big ideas? How can they get in the spotlight and and find a uh, a following for the things that Mm -hmm. really matter to them? Well, this leads me to another question which is, as you're talking about having your pulpit and making the transition, what's what's the difference between personal brand, thought leadership, recognized expert? I mean, can you just call yourself a thought leader? What does, uh, how do we, how does that work? Yeah, I think it's such a great question. And I don't think you can call yourself a thought leader. I think it's really sort of that, that term that somebody applies to you uh, after a certain point. But here's where I think it begins. I think it begins in anybody's career with thinking about your personal brand. What is it? What are the values you stand for? What are the skills you want to be known for? Creating that perspective of someone as a unique individual. That Mm -hmm. I think personal brand, you know, sure it's about your, your beautiful colors and things like this, but I think it is more about what do you, how do you take a, um, a perspective in the world and stand out as someone unique? I think that's the first step. Then the second step is to be recognized for your expertise. And that that, of course, isn't going to happen overnight. That is, is somebody who is building knowledge and sharing knowledge um, over time. I think that's sort of the second stage in, in our journey. But then the third piece, I think, is this idea of thought leadership. And for me, the way I describe the difference, so leader to me is sort of one to many. It's somebody who mm-hmm. is pushing their ideas to people that they're regularly connected to. But thought leadership is what I call many to many. How do we get people that we know to pick up our ideas and carry them to their communities outwards to people that we don't know? So how can we be that pebble in the pond that brings out a circle, a circle, a circle of idea sharing in a way that communicates effective change? And that is the harder work. And I don't think that that is something that 
A, we all know intuitively how to do, but B, I don't think that it's something that until you've done it for a while that you can even be that anointed, that thought leader, but it is about being of service. It is about thinking about your, your greater change that you want in the world, whether it's technological change, societal change, whether you have something that you're trying to push forward in your community, whatever it is that you're working towards it, and being of service about, if you're thinking about creating a movement and mo working towards that effort, you may never ever really create a movement, but moving towards that thinking and thinking about how we affect change, that to me is the journey. So it starts with personal branding, move to recognized expert, move to this goal of really bringing about societal or, or, or technological change. Well, this journey is really what I wanted to ask you about today. So let me phrase this a slightly different way then. Uh, clearly, there's a journey to becoming a thought leader and one reaps all sorts of benefits on the way. It's a lot of work though, because you've got to sit down and write those speeches, which is what I help people with as it help them create the speeches that establish them as thought leaders. Why does it matter? Why should executive women take the time and the effort to develop, to develop that thought leadership piece? I think there's a couple of reasons. One of them is what I consider it as career insurance. I really mm. believe that this is the way in which we get taken more seriously. We get the, the credibility and the influence and the impact that we want. We, we live more of our purpose, which is often what we are doing here. We have a chance mm -hmm. to leave a legacy that matters. Often we get paid better because we are well known as a thought leader. But there's also there's one little hidden piece that I see with my clients. If they end up with it, if they're in an executive position and they end up facing some internal winds of change mm -hmm. and someone is trying to push them out, if they have a broad following, if they do have a broad public reputation as a thought leader or as a recognized expert, it becomes a little more difficult to just push some someone aside. So I think it really creates that, that reputational uh, branding that is going to mean that people should take you seriously. Thank you for saying that. That is the core of what I do in, in my training is to help women stop being ignored and to be heard. And in order to be heard, you have to have something to say. So you might yeah. as well start, um, developing what your thought leadership piece is, even if as, even if you just get to the point of recognized expert, maybe your ideas don't take off. This is, it still is going to make you more valuable, more visible. And it will also, uh, you either get to keep your job or you get promoted, or maybe it helps you get the better job, the better next job. Absolutely. And, and I think on top of that, people want to come and work for you. People want to affiliate with, so you might get invited to be on a board or an advisory board, a council or a community uh, leadership role. There's a lots of ways that once you step out of that sort of comfort zone of just doing your to-do list every day that allow you to now have that broader impact because people know that you're out there. I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many, how frustrating it's been. And I'm sure you've had this experience too. People will call me up and they'll say, you know, we want to recognize somebody or we want to invite somebody um, into a leadership role uh, in the community. But when I go and Google them, I don't find anything about them. I hear they're great. Oh. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, how much time does it really take to do a great LinkedIn profile? A few hours? How yeah. many things are you leaving? How many opportunities are you leaving on the side because you aren't willing to step into your own power and your own spotlight? That I want to help people get over that like you do, because it is so frustrating to me. There are so many women with so many brilliant ideas and I'm tired of them being overlooked, honestly. And often... It's the women who are not generating the drama. And so they get taken for granted, which yeah. is the, the huge part. I, you know, I tend to I tend to be working with problem solvers because they're the people who their their department runs just fine, thank you. And <laughs> then they see then they see that their uh, the promotions are going to the louder, flashier people as opposed to the competent ones. And of course, some of it has to do with Western business 
being set up to value loud and flashy and not recognizing the value of, I think there's a line between being visible for all the right reasons and rising above the level of competence to, as you say, recognize expert. It's in, and that of course is the difference. That's where the glass ceiling comes in where people bump into glass ceilings because they're competent, but they aren't seen as leaders and strategic thinkers. Yeah, I think it's this idea of moving from success to significance, right? You Ooh. really need to be, it's a, it's a program that I participated in a few years ago called High Power, which is a women's leadership program started here in the Bay Area. And the, the woman who runs it, that was her line, you know, moving from success to significance. And I've always thought that is, is a very powerful uh, phrase and way to think about ourselves that, that we do want to be significant. We want this career we've worked so hard mm-hmm. to, to uh, move forward to actually matter. And so I always say those ones who are the problems solvers, like let's get them to write the the toolkit, share the best practices, create the lessons learned blog, you know, do a talk on all of what it takes to run a successful division that is, you know, full of problem solvers and is people who are just putting things together and getting things done. You know, why why not then if you have those skills? teach others how to do that. Thought leadership is also in my mind about being of service to others, being that guide from the side who helps people to to see the way forward, see what they've already accomplished so we don't keep reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. Then how do we, where's a good place to start? I'm I'm gonna ask you this on two pieces. So uh, two parts, where's a place to start if you haven't started yet? And if you are, part way along, what would be the next, how would you amplify this? I know you've, you have four phases you, you recommend. And so let's talk about beginners and then amplifier amplification. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I think one of the things that you do is is really helping on one of those pieces so brilliantly. It is this piece about being a spokesperson. How, what are the issues that you care most about? How can you get your voice heard? So being that spokesperson is a great place, uh, but it isn't often the first place. It is because it can be more challenging. Like, do I have anything to say? So I often say, maybe there's a step before that, which is what I call being that amplifier, that curator of information. So thinking about any leader, and all the information that comes into them in a typical day through the people they meet, the newsletters they read, the things that they've um, been exposed to in a conference, the people that they're communicating with, how can they curate the best of the best and share and amplify those ideas and those people, those books, those resources to others? So I think that's a great way. I, I often get my clients, their first blog post is, you know, the five things you need to know about this field that I care most about. Here's, mm-hmm. here's five ways you could get the best information. So curate, amplify. That's like a really great first step. Another great step is to be a convener, bringing people together to the table to create a shared message around something that needs to move forward. Mm. You know, that could be something in your community. It could be a technological shift. It could be something that your, your, your division or department has moved forward could be an internal group, it could be an external group. So think about one of my clients, um, you know, she was a senior level executive in the utility industry and she brought Uh, she was in workforce development and she brought together workforce development leaders from across the entire utility industry in order to start propagating change in workforce development. Another client who is a head of people at a major company brought together other chief people officers from other tech companies, and they're working on workforce of the future issues together. And so this idea of convening in order to collaborate around how can we together bring about better change. So that's a great second step. The third, I think, is being that spokesperson, sort of stepping into that role, Mm -hmm. finding our voice. And then I think the last one is one that that happens over time as we're beginning to build that followership. And that's what I call share the microphone. You know, how can you use your platform for the good of others whose voices are getting overlooked? The diverse voices, the, mm-hmm. the, the folks who are just under uh, underappreciated, undervalued. So I think those are great places for people just beginning. And then I do really want to answer that second question you asked, which is, and now what if you made some progress, 
what can you do? Of course, any of those first four strategies you can keep doing and keep building on. Mm -hmm. But the final one is uh, what I call building your framework. One Mm. of the major lessons that I learned in writing my book is the difference between a leader and a thought leader is really the person who has distilled those lessons learned. I mean, we spoke about it a few minutes ago, but can you build a a literal framework, a visual framework that others can use to understand what you've done and what you believe needs to happen? So I think about sort of back in the day when I was in fourth grade, I learned that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Right. We all had that visual. That's the first visual framework I ever saw, but how could you create whatever you're doing into a visual framework? Or is there a blueprint or a toolkit or a franchise manual or whatever? Is there some way to document how people can get to the change that's underway in your organization, in your community, in your field, so that others, again, can learn from us? That to me is the advanced technique that differentiates. Can you write the book? Can you write the the guidebook, the workbook, something that allows others to, to follow in your footsteps, that that's the real differentiator in leaders to thought leaders. Cause now if you want to create a movement, people need the guide, you know, I want to be able to, yeah. pick up the guide. <laughs> I want to know what to do. That's so you're telling people what to do. And here's where it's so useful to be working with somebody who can help you. Most of us are way too close to our own process. <laughs> So true. <laughs> that you've got, you've got to have somebody with fresh eyes who can help you uh, see what you're doing and say, so how did you get from five to seven? And you go, oh, well, it's number six, of course. But you know it so well, you forget to. Um, I have people, I, there are a lot of people I pay a lot of money to to help me see where I am assuming things. And where it's like, oh, you have to spell that part out, unpack it, unpack it. I I do the same work. And that's what I love about what you're doing. You know, we both are on this same journey to help people really find what is their genius and how can we get that genius out in the world in a way that feels authentic to them and is really distilling it into distilling what they've learned and what they know into a usable framework and methodology for others. And it's so satisfying, isn't it? To yes. just to be the person to say, to help them. My mother was a potter. And I remember at one point realizing, especially when I moved from it with the opera singers, uh, you know, I was never good enough to be a singer. When I realized that I didn't have to be the clay, I could be the potter. And as a director, and then later as a producer, which is where I really found my artistic home, creating the whole process and running the company, was I didn't have to be the one who was out on stage singing. I could be the one that set it all up Mm -hmm. so that the person who is the face that the audience sees has a structure behind them. The producer. The producer, right which is incredibly satisfying. And I'm sure that you, like I, have the clients where after you hang up from a session, you jump up and dance around your office going, they're so smart, I love this, they're so smart, I love working with smart people. It is a joy. And it is particularly a joy for me when it is senior women leaders that are really finding their voice for the first time and really getting getting that followership and getting people to pay attention after being overlooked for too long and finding that that, well, for so long, they thought that was for other people or I don't have anything to say or whatever those messages are. I call it the itty bitty shitty committee in their brain, right? Yeah, right. For so long, that committee has been what's running things versus no, let's let's. Inst- Instead, own our truth and our expertise and really be that guide from the side for others to to help them along on their journeys. It must be helpful to have Stanford on your resume, to be have that association with Stanford and the Thought Leadership Lab. Can you talk a little bit about about that and what that is? So if people want to look you up, the easy way to look you up is, is Stanford, right? 
Well, yes. So I am an alum of the business school at Stanford, which was quite a journey in its own way. But then I also came over to the other side and became an instructor. So I taught there for several years, uh, a course that the first course I'd ever had on thought leadership. And I co-taught with a wonderful communications instructor, J.D. Schramm. And we co collaborated on creating and, and uh, launching that course and running it for a couple of years. Uh, but yeah, thoughtleadershiplab.com. That is my home where all of my uh, my world lives, all of the, my services and my content. And I'm also very active on LinkedIn and have a couple of great courses on thought leadership on LinkedIn learning so that those are my two places where you can best find me. I love it when I get more people to come on and, and read my newsletter and, and comment and ask questions because, you know, this is, this is a collaborative journey learning about thought yeah. leadership and getting better with it as it is what you do, right? We want to have that, mm -hmm. that conversation with the people that engage with us. Uh, well, thank you, Denise. It's such such a joy to have you. Um, this is going to be uh, launching in, we're going to come out in September. So I feel like it's kind of launching the season, all those years of, uh, of launching fall seasons in the arts, is to be able to launch the season with you to be talking about this. I've been following you for some time and so delighted to have you as a friend. What is one thing? that someone can do if they're, if they're thinking about how they could become a thought leader? What would be the very first thing? Well, without sounding too self-aggrandizing, I would say my book. You know, I wrote a book uh, called Ready to Be a Thought Leader a couple of years ago, and I really wrote it to my younger self. I wrote it to the girl who was starting out at the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs in this great role with no plan and no strategy. And I wrote the book to her as if what all of what I wish I'd known then. And mm -hmm. people who buy it tell me that they, you know, it's yellow underlined and dog-eared and <laughs> highlighted and st stickered and whatever, because it really is designed as a guidebook. And it really does give you any way you kind of land in the book. You don't have to start at the beginning and live, but any way you land, there's a resource, there's a next step, there's a there's something to motivate you and energize you. And I, I've really, it was such a joy to write this. And it's even more of a joy when somebody gets some value and I'm regularly getting notes from people who've either taken one of my courses based on the book or read the book. And, and that's all I want to do. I want to share these ideas of how people can get started and how the rewards will flow as a result. Because you are a thought leader. So it is a wonderful book and I highly recommend it. Denise, thank you so much for being on Speakers Who Get Results. It's been a, a delight to have you. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host. And let me remind you that if you're curious how you can get better results from your speaking and your presenting, you can take our free four minute quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And there in four minutes, you can see where your skills are strong and where perhaps a little support might help you get the recognition and the results that you need and deserve. Thank you very much, Denise Brosseau. And I will see you all on the next one. Thanks, Elizabeth. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.